Hello everyone. Welcome to the ninth edition of Newton Speaks conducted by IST and ITC students chapter. This is a monthly webinar series where we bring in guests who not only think outside the box but also redefine the very box just like Isaac Isaac Newton did. Today we are joined by uh, Super Priya Dashini who is an award winning science journalist and currently the chief editor at Nature India. She has been keenly following the evolving science and research and innovation uh, climate in Asia through the last couple of decades. As a list of her accomplishments, I feel it will be better if uh, I were to mention the stuff she hasn't done. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but let's uh, still let me take the time to mention a few. Uh, Ma'am has uh, served on many international com- uh, committees and meetings on science communication, environment, health, and climate change. She received the uh, BBC World Service Trust Award for her coverage on the vanishing islands of Sundarbans, which many of us have actually read. Uh, the Pan South uh, South America Asia Media Excellence Award for her coverage of on climate issues, and uh, uh, has also uh, held an outreach program that trains scientists in communication and presentation skills. Uh, before I pass over the mic to you, ma'am, uh, so we can finally stop us talking and start listening to you. <laughs> I do have to say, with your massive list of honors, we it actually blew us away. Like uh, you must have been an amazing journalist. uh now all this given i must ask what was your college life like who uh, not as exciting as you guys i'm <laughs> sure because um i i passed out of college like what 25 years back or oh, what yes um undergrad so so yeah in those times you didn't have google and <laughs> you didn't have smartphones or mobile phones so all your communication was through handwritten letters mostly <laughs> in college so so you couldn't whatsapp if you were to propose somebody for instance and, <laughs> and you had to actually write letters and um, and uh, college life was really interesting for me because i got to study what i wanted uh, i didn't i mean there was immense pressure of course to get into the medicine field and mm. i did get get into it but i didn't get a great rank so i didn't want to be a dentist i uh, chose to study zoology instead uh, and uh, went into something that i wanted to study so that was fantastic for me i got teachers who were really really inspiring um and and i i studied in uh, the orissa university of agriculture technology uh, in the bsc a program you know it wasn't really the agriculture technology or the engineering so it was like a stale um, a very very placid kind of an environment but the teachers that we got um, i i am in touch with them even today and they continue to continue to bless me and inspire me so i think what i got as an undergrad was uh, the blessing of uh, fantastic teachers and their hand holding um uh, at the same time college life also meant we had to cycle uh, from from where we where i lived you know it was like almost 20 kilometers away and uh, it might sound like a story from oh when we were kids uh, we used to study on the lamp post etc kind of a story but no i didn't st- the study on the lamp post i had a fantastic uh, bringing in my parents as well uh, but my uh, college was far away and so that cycling really also helped me understand a bunch of other things beyond just science you know uh, that i was pursuing at that time and so i digressed from science later in life when i when i went into my masters i got enrolled into an msc zoology but uh, left it uh, midway uh, you know just in the into 3 months uh, of msc zoology i went into doing management doing law then uh, studying journalism uh, going off to study in london uh, print journalism english journalism etc so a whole bunch of things before i finally decided what i wanted to <laughs> be but since you asked college it's really evoking <laughs> so many wonderful memories but i'll stop there <laughs> Uh, okay. Before we want to talk, a side note to the audience: if you have any queries uh, or questions, do address them to the host in the chat. 
we'll address them towards the end of the session. And without further ado, ma'am, over to you. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so let me just see if this is working. Sure. Um, is it? Mm. Not, yet. Not yet. yet. Okay. Right. Screen. Yes, now it is sharing. Lovely. Um, good to go? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Could you just like hide the bottom thing? Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, so, um, I just wanted to uh, know a little bit more about uh, our audience today so that I can tailor it for you guys, um, the talk. Uh, all of us are what uh, undergrad students. Yes, ma'am. Uh, they are mostly undergraduate students now. Okay, and um, from what streams? Engineering mostly. All of um, them are from. Yeah. All of them from engineering. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fantastic. So, so I keep talking to people about science communication, and uh, uh, these people constitute a wide variety of sections uh, of our society. Um, I speak to uh, policymakers about science communication, how to do uh, communication well for policymaking. I speak to educators, academics. I conduct workshops for students such as yourself who are invested in science and want to go further in their careers as communicators, sometime as journalists uh, of science. And uh, I speak to science communicators as well, who are already in the field, who want to do this more and better. I also speak to uh, advocates of health and uh, science who want to uh, create outreach programs. So, uh, so there's a bunch of people that I address this kind of uh, uh, science communication for scientists. So this should be actually science communication for engineers kind of a thing so let's just dive in and and figure out why we need to communicate science or for this audience uh, your engineering science why do we need to do that what's the what's the very rationale for somebody like me who's um, coming from uh, the science journalism field and there's a very thin line between science journalism and science communication which we can we can deal with when I go in. Um, so these are some of the benefits for your uh, perusal for your intake. If you want to sort of uh, get into a field where communication is core, and even if you don't want to do it full time, even if you are an engineer in in your own profession, if you still want to do something um, in the communication area as a Thing that you want to pursue as a hobby or as something that raises your own profile, then these are some of the benefits. So the altruistic benefits, like I, um, I, I, I like to call them that, because you are trying not to get um, a uh, direct benefit in terms of practical, um, you know, benefits for yourself. So then you can actually be doing science communication to, uh, for instance, inspire the next generation of researchers or engineers or scientists. Like you must have been inspired by somebody or something to get into this field. There might be seven, several reasons for you to have come to this. And uh, now one of those reasons could be that you saw somebody in this field who was a researcher or an engineer who wanted to come here and so you got inspired. So this is your payback time, really, by doing that communication and inspiring the next generation of researchers. And you can do that by several means. You could actually, in these times, be scotching pseudoscience and anti-science and fake news uh, by communicating science, by communicating your exact field of study. You could be raising awareness about say your branch of engineering or your branch of research by by communicating well you could of course you know and this is one of the most 
um, well-quoted reasons why people communicate science is inform the public about your science. So if you are not the altruistic kind and you want to have a practical benefit from, um, from uh, communicating science, so these could be some of the practical benefits. You could actually, if not anything, be developing a new skill you could uh, which which you can use in many other fields or many other uh, ways in your life uh, of communicating well you could be networking better with your peers with people from other disciplines in science and engineering you could actually be raising your personal and your institute's profile overall by uh, by communicating science by communicating your research you could perhaps be getting the next tranche of your fund by uh, communicating well. You could perhaps be improving the quality of your research or the impact of your work in, in those communications. I'll take you very, very quickly um, through, through the power of storytelling. That's the bread and butter for people like me who communicate science every day of their life either through journalistic pursuits or through sheer science communication and outreach uh, you know, kind of activities. So why is storytelling so important and why does that hold good for anything that you might be doing? You could be writing a research paper, you could be writing a, say, a proposal for a grant, you could be writing um, just to, um, you know, inform others about your work in a blog piece or an opinion piece, say in a newspaper, or you could be writing a script for a podcast or a or a uh, film, whatever uh, takes your fancy. Why is a story at the heart of all that you want to tell? And I'll take you very briefly about what we do at Nature India. So we. And you might have uh, had the uh, some basic knowledge about what nature is as a group, what we do. So nature is a multidisciplinary um, uh, journal, science journal, which takes in manuscripts, uh, original articles, or original research papers from variety of disciplines, from you know starting from astrophysics to neuroscience to um, to cell biology to uh, nanomaterials, whatever. So uh, that's the primary research, which is peer reviewed, which is, um, you know, undergoes a really rigorous process before everything is published. So Nature receives a huge bunch of submissions every week, and we publish about 20 to 25 papers out of, say, uh, 5,000, 7,000, 10,000 papers every week that we receive. So uh, all of these undergo a uh, a uh, really severe, uh, rigorous peer review, like you know. And there are many engineering uh, fields now coming into nature's core activities. Uh, and so we we have nanosciences, materials, we have energy, um, and so on and so forth. So um, Nature India is uh, the front half of nature kind of magazine stuff for uh, for India specific audiences. So we like to call ourselves the um, storytellers of India's science for a global audience. We pick up stories of science from India and we uh, create a balanced, uh, again, a really rigorously researched, uh, well-told, well-articulated stories uh, for not just uh, the Indian science community, but anybody who's interested in science emerging out of India around the world. What is at the core of a great story? How do we choose these stories? How, how do we make sure that it is important for our audiences that we serve? And uh, one of the key things that we look at in a good story is its relevance to people. So relevance to our audiences, not just the science community, but also anybody who might care to come on to the website and have a look at what's happening in science in India. So the relevance of each and every story 
is very, very important for us. And what might be that kind of stories which are relevant? So you see um, anything that pertains to, say, um, healthcare stories like diseases or new drugs or uh, things that are emerging in health sciences. Those would be really relevant to everybody. Uh, climate change stories, it could be from the engineering angle as well. Of Like, I, uh, like in the last slide, we saw this um, special issue that Nature India produced about engineering solutions to COVID-19. That was something that was very close to my heart because everybody's telling stories of, you know, the crisis, the vaccines, the drugs, the, you know, uh, healthcare system crumbling, etc. But uh, at the core of all those innovations was engineering. And I thought that uh, those stories needed to be told how nanosciences, how photonics, how, um, you know, um, other kinds of health, AI are really um, focused on healthcare and how they have really challenged our understanding of um, how solutions can be delivered for not just the COVID-19 pand pandemic, but any pandemic in the future to come. So those stories were important and I urge you all to go to the Nature India website and look at this special issue that we produced. Uh, it was totally dedicated to engineering sciences and and uh, the solutions that engineers provided during these tough times. And it's free to download this issue on Nature India. So those kinds of stories are really important. Climate change, as I said, and then the uh, uh, the debate around uh, genetically, genetically modified food. Everybody is interested in that kind of stories. Uh, um, the other angle that we look at in our stories, and I also know that many of you might want to tell stories uh, of uh, your own disciplines, of your own research work and future, or even now. Um, so try and look for an interesting angle in those stories, something that has not been told, perhaps something that is unexpected for readers, something that is unusual or astounding, amazing, you know, the kind of stories that we deal in, in that genre, uh, astrophysics stories, uh, something about dinosaurs always interests people, about new archaeological findings, about new species, about a new variant of a virus. All of these things are obviously very, very interesting and uh, unusual for everybody to know. So science journalists or communicators, make it their bread and butter, so to say, to dig out these interesting facets of um, um, you know, stories and make them better known, make them well known. Also, the uniqueness of stories is something that springs out when any paper or any uh, you know, a blog piece or opinion piece or comment comes to us. And we, we figure out that if it is unique, in its approach to telling the story, then perhaps it will click well with our audiences. And that holds true for anybody who's writing anything. So if you can highlight the uniqueness, the novelty in your story, then perhaps it stands a chance of being read better. Uh, so in this genre, some things that we do is perhaps a new gene that has been described, a new genome of a new plant or an animal species that has been described is interesting to us and our readers. Uh, if it's uh, something like a first test tube baby story or a first genetically modified organism that I said, you know, alluded to earlier, or you know, anything that is in astrophysics is always interesting. But if it's the first, the superlative, so the strongest, fastest highest, tallest, smallest, every of those super, each of those superlatives actually makes for great narratives, great stories. So is something that is newsworthy, that is emerging or here and now, like we uh, like to call it. Uh, so anything that has an emergent or current interest uh, among audiences always is told well. So, and it's, it's always getting you those 
you know, audiences and hits. So people always want to know what is happening right now in their disciplines in science or in other disciplines in science or in research. So we try to make it current and anybody who tries to hit up that news point in their story always makes sense to an audience. Also, if your story is around a great personality in your sphere, in your uh, peers, among um, people doing uh, interdisciplinary sciences or people who have achieved a huge bunch of things in their own spheres, uh, those are the kind of people uh, that inspire others. And people want to hear those uh, many times autobiographical stories, many times biographical stories. And so if you include some sort of persona, some sort of um, inspiring angle to your story, well, which, which might have a higher impact than usual uh, stories. So that also really sells well as a good story. Or if your story has beautiful images, so uh, so this is an image of the black hole that was made really famous, and now people are debating whether it was actually uh, a black hole image or not. And so also, uh, as we know, uh, an image can tell a story worth a thousand words. So why not use brilliant images in your storytelling, in your in your research pieces, in your manuscripts, in whatever work you want to do in communication. If your uh, images are worth, uh, you know, uh, really capturing people's imagination, then surely go ahead and use those images as well. So now we'll uh, talk a little bit about how to turn science stories into stories that make sense for everyone. And I typically, uh, tell this to people who are steeped in manuscript writing, people who are steeped in their research, and they are many times much jumbled in their own um, set of jargons. So they talk in jargons, they um, think in jargons, they many times write in jargons and communicate in jargons. So how can we sort of bring uh, that kind of a uh, jargon-laced story down to a level where uh, anybody who's coming to that story or to that piece of writing or communication can make sense of it very easily. And so how as you, uh, you as researchers and uh, engineers uh, really make that switch from being jargon-laced to something that everybody can understand. So, um, in a manuscript, typically what we do is we write it like this. So the chronology is a broad background to your research work, a very specific background. Then you come to the problem or your motivation sentence or statement. And then you go into what kind of methods did you use to arrive at your research or do your research. Then you come to the results. Then you contextualize your finding the uh, so what question uh, is where you come to. And then you conclude your, your research paper by uh, writing down a sharp conclusion about what your story, your research actually was about. And then if you still have the uh, inclination and uh, the space or, or you have an implication from your research, you point that out to your readers or your peers in a manuscript. Um, now, this is a typical manuscript. How can you turn that around into a simple story that anybody can understand? So you typically talk about your conclusions first in a simple story, in a, in a popular communication. So how do you do that? You basically arrive at what has been the key finding of your research at the top of the story. So you basically tell people what it was that you concluded from your research. Then you go on to talk about the key findings 
you know, if there are several findings from your story, from your research, then you go into those key findings. Then you talk about why it should be important for them. Why should they be reading this story? Why should this research have an impact? Like we talked about uh, what's the relevance of this uh, story? Why should this be interesting for them? What could be um, the, the impact on their daily life from this research, etc.? And then you come to what could be, what has been the problem that you wanted to address? So basically the research question that you're asking, that you were asking and why and how then you arrived at these results. And, and this is a typical turning around a manuscript or a research work on its head to find out key answers for a lay audience you know, in a typical popular communication format. So uh, let me very briefly again take you into what we learned as communicators, science communicators from the COVID-19 pandemic and how it actually informed our own, uh, you know, uh, journalistic and communication practice uh, that we did in daily life. COVID-19 really turned again a lot of things that we knew earlier as journalists and communicators on their head. So we understood very clearly that communicating uncertainty was something that was new to policymakers, to a to lot of uh, countries and a lot of uh, academics who had not done this at a, at a huge scale earlier. So the imponderables of research and science are as important to communicate as the known factors of science. So what we know in science is good, but we know that science evolves and that's the very nature of science. And so it's great for everybody to be able to communicate those imponderables well. The questions that we were constantly asking and the answers that we, we were constantly getting from science were evolving overnight many times in a span of a couple of hours. And it was very difficult to keep pace with the rapidly evolving science. So it was very essential that we, we communicated these uncertainties that look here, we know this much at this point of time, and we will know better maybe tomorrow. But as of now, this is what science is telling us. So like we know that uh, science really played out and research really played out so vastly in public gaze for the first time and uh, scientists uh, public uh, health uh, professionals researchers uh, epidemiologists virologists all of these people suddenly took center stage and people were all looking at them and still are for answers so it was very important for all of these people to understand the uncertainty of all of this communication and also to communicate that uh, those unanswered questions alongside the hope. And all of this really needs training. That's what we understood. Same applies to perhaps engineering sciences. We know a bunch of things today, but we also don't know a bunch of things. So those unknowns those variables are important to be told those riders are important to uh, spring up in our communication uh, whenever we try to make a popular piece out of it so again uh, from covid 19 we learned that uh, we need to be very transparent and honest in our communication we knew how uh, data can be so important to creating public trust uh, in science and uh, how when you're armed with data, people take your, um, you know, you, your communication um, more seriously. They take it better. And uh, how telling those data-driven stories uh, became important in the face of lack of data and um, not so much clarity from government agencies, which were giving us those data uh, about um, you know, uh, the number of people who died or the number number of people who were affected or the vaccination numbers, etc. So there was a lot of hesitancy in the beginning 
um, and continues to be in many parts to uh, divulge data better. And so as communicators, it became very important to look for alternate sources of data and to dig those sources out and to keep them all in front of people so that they can be better judges, better informed of what the situation was and continues to be in, in the public sphere, in, in, the, in the public health sphere. So, so involving the public in taking decision, decisions by themselves uh, and giving them the wealth of data that is there beyond just traditional sources. That's something we learned. And all of us know this uh, beautiful flatten the curve graph. And it's a great example of how, you know, using data creatively actually became key to um, talking about data. So this is also something very important for all of you who, who handle data, large scale data, or all of you who aspire to tell data driven stories. So. You can, you can do that by being very creative about data, humanizing data, and being um, sort of telling those uh, key uh, stories by, um, by making data more accessible and more human for anybody who wants to approach it. We also understood that it, it may not just be about science research or engineering, for instance, to, uh, to approach a societal problem. It is all interdisciplinary. We are, again, a really, really uh, connected world. And uh, science and non-science or pseudoscience or fake news travel equally fast. So it became very important for communicators to come to this point of convergence where we borrowed heavily from science, humanities, social sciences, from, uh, as I said, all kinds of data, all kinds of storytelling techniques. So really making all of this very important in all our storytelling. And very briefly, how can you, as future communicators or researchers uh, who are interested in communication, could uh, take the plunge and um, you know, switch from being um, hardcore scientists and engineers and researchers to also embracing the world of science communication and research communication. You could, uh, and I'm talking about this from a popular perspective. Of course, you know that you can write manuscripts, you can get published in high impact journals or uh, you know, uh, wherever you fancy, but uh, at the same time, uh, peer communication is something that is restricted to just a set of people. So you tell your story to your peers and they hear it and it gets uh, many times buried in those research journals. But if you want to go beyond those journals, if you want your communication to be more impactful and more people driven and more beneficial to societies that you serve, then probably you can do one of these several things to begin with. Uh, you could involve people as uh, we just now talked about from various disciplines, from multiple fields, especially in, um, in your organization, in your institutes, uh, go to your press office if you have one and figure out what kind of stories do they want to write to create more impact about your own institution and your own discipline in the outside world. So you will pro probably be also coming across people in your own organization and institute who have um, some experience in communicating uh, their research and, and just general communication. You could lean on them. You could uh, you know, look at their expertise and figure out how they do it, craft stories according to how they have been doing and then go from there. Uh, you could uh, ask to visit a newsroom and many newsrooms will actually oblige you by inviting you to uh, you know, uh, come and sit with them for a day or for an hour uh, to see how 
things work in in newspaper offices that's the most uh, popular kind of communication that we you will come across so you might want to uh, talk to reporters call call them up write to them and uh, not just science reporters but any kind of journalists any kind of reporters and see uh, what is interesting to them and maybe pitch a story that uh, might be very interesting to them or uh, something that is very interesting to you and pitch it to them in a manner that becomes interesting to them uh, you could uh, many times request to sit in an uh, editorial meeting in a uh, newsroom uh, you could perhaps um, get absolutely hands-on you know not do any of these and just go and write your piece if you're good at it and uh, see how your press office deals with press releases how do they write those press releases what are the things that they pick up for press releases why do they do so what are the what is the rationale again for them to pick one story over the other and you that will make you make sense for you when you approach your story your communication from that angle uh, you could actually conduct interviews inside your own disciplines inside your own uh, faculties departments and see if there is a new interesting story to tell many organizations and institutes do that very effectively these days in india uh, and they have popular communication websites uh, where they post videos of interviews with their own faculty they post blog pieces written by their own institute people they also do um, you know kind of uh, podcasts uh, they they use so many new uh, media to uh, to tell these science and research stories they do multimedia stories they do videos for instance uh, on on what's happening in their own institutes etc so you could also create a web page that is dynamic and has communication aspects to it you could uh, write a blog piece you could you know do several things you could do science illustrations which is gaining currency these days in india very very much and learn those tricks and um, create uh, something of value to your own uh, academies or institutes so uh, you could start off somewhere there and then uh, you know go into the other steps like i mentioned so um, good luck to all of you who want to become good communicators and uh, probably also um, worth mentioning that um, I'm happy to, um, you know, handhold anybody who wants to come in. We also launched the Science Journalists Association of India last month, which is a group of science journalists. And we have associate memberships for anybody who wants to come in as a communicator and who's done some work in science communication. So uh, feel free to, um, you know, reach out to any of us and uh, you will find more information on all of us and uh, really um, um, you know come to us for any any more mentoring thank you very much thank you uh, that was actually amazing uh, i love the part where you're like uh, where you mentioned how covid 19 was an issue which people had uh, trust problems because the data was not explain properly to the people so and the people who are coming up to present the data had no previous interaction of uh, engaging such a large audience so that caused a lot of issues of miscommunication and wrong storytelling uh, absolutely yes so before we start our q and a session uh, here's like one uh, question which we ask every speaker so far what is your favorite book ah <laughs> so many right now i'm reading blink if you know yeah the art of thinking without thinking. Yes. Um, so, I mean, that's my bread and butter, right? Reading <laughs> books. So, and then that's that's a really tricky question, like asking a musician, "What's your favorite music?" But um, I do think that uh, 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 several Indian um, uh, origin authors are now really coming up and writing uh, fantastic rose surely in the science communication field and uh, um, i i have read most recently 
uh, oh, of course, he's Indian origin, but not Indian. Jean, I don't know whether you've read, read in the book called Jean by Siddhartha Mukherjee. Um, that's a beautiful book where he, it's a huge tome, like this fact, but uh, uh, he, he personalizes, personalizes the story about the gene. So he's talking about uh, gene, its history, where it comes from, how we discovered it, and where we are going with it. Um, and he talks about gene from his own perspective of his family having genetic uh, diseases in the past, some members of his family, and then he goes into history about genetic uh, problems of, um, uh, you know, talking about the uh, Russian uh, monarchs uh, who had um, genetic, uh, uh, you know, diseases, how they overcome came those. So fascinating tome, uh, and I, I hope all of you can lay your hands on Jean. There's Rebecca Skluts. Uh, book, I don't know whether you've read the um, Henrietta Lacks book. Um, so it's the story of the HeLa cells uh, that is so important in biological research. Uh, so uh, try and uh, look it up, uh, Henrietta Lacks. Uh, it has got many layers of storytelling in it. Um, and then the other book, I think, Angela Sinis, uh, two books, Inferior and Superior, which talk about race and gender in science. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> off the top of my head, those ones. Okay. With that, we can start the Q&A session. We got a list of questions in the form and also some questions in the chat. Uh, Ma'am, which has been the most fascinating publication that you came across? recently in the uh, Nature magazine? Again, wrong question to ask, <laughs> but, but I'll try. In Nature magazine, um, I always like uh, stories that are interdisciplinary, which uh, have multiple layers to them. So, uh, for instance, one of the and I'm talking about research papers. I mean, there are several, yeah. and all nature stories are th so thoroughly uh, uh, researched and nuanced that uh, they all of them are gems. So I, I the one that uh, that uh, comes to my mind and maybe interesting to you is uh, a manuscript I read about um, putting back the philosophy in the PhD. So uh, uh, PhD generally all of us know is philosophy, right? Has some mm -hmm. element of philosophy or used to have and how it increasingly has become super specialized and there's no philosophy left in PhD <laughs> anymore. So how how are researchers across the world are trying to bring that philosophy back into PhD and what are the steps they are taking and uh, how fascinating it would be to make PhD uh, a, a broad-based, interdisciplinary, uh, philosophical, um, you know, thing to do rather than just restrict it to a very narrow study of one super specialized thing. So I think that one was one of my favorites. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, okay. So what do you believe uh, makes India stand out in the field of scientific research? I think uh, the frugal innovation nature of science in India, which cuts both ways. It is uh, the bane and boom, both for India's science. Uh, we call it Jugaad uh, <laughs> in, in Hindi. And it's actually a internationally popular term now. Uh, how Indian scientists, despite the fact that they do not have the luxury of space, infrastructure, and many times funds uh, still come up with such brilliant pockets of innovation and research is something that boggles my mind as well. And I think that, uh, you know, people talk about why India has not had a Nobel in so many years or why India is um, not at par with 
say, China in terms of our, um, our research acumen, you know, producing research articles or why aren't we there in the top 100 list uh, worldwide in research, etc. So, so many things are asked. And as a journalist, I am always trying to be balanced in my approach to that question. I, I do understand the challenges that Indian scientists face. Just yesterday, we did a story on a survey of PhD candidates across India. And it's actually trending on Twitter right now, that story on Nature India. It's uh, about uh, the difficulties that PhD students have faced through the pandemic and what happened to their research in these. And it's a global story. It's not just about mm -hmm. India's, but what makes India's the India story or the um, or the developing world story so much more important in science uh, for everybody to look at? We already are hamstrung by you know lack of resources. Our reagents don't come in time. Our labs are so hamstrung by uh, funding issues, and then COVID nineteen happens, and then mm -hmm. we just shut our labs and libraries and people don't have access to funds for months on end. How is all of that really impacting the science in this country? So the frugal nature of our science is something really boggles my mind. And it also uh, boggles the mind of many others who look at India's science from outside India. And uh, they keep telling us how is it that Indian scientists are still able to, you know, produce such brilliant work? And of course, it's not not like we don't have pockets of brilliantly funded institutes and academies or organizations, and we have some really good funders now. Uh, but yes, overall, if you if you see eighty or ninety percent of this country's science is basically mired in these issues, and so so I think that is a standout thing in our ecosystem. I see. Yeah. Uh, ma'am, one of the questions that came in the chat was, uh, it is widely believed that the Indian CBC system doesn't train students for writing research type articles. On one hand, we are expected to be eloquent and descriptive uh, in our English papers, but for subjects like science and social studies, we are expected to be brief and to the point. Uh, what are your thoughts on this and how do you think we can inculcate more research minded writing at the school or college level? Absolutely brilliant question and I keep getting this question all the time and uh, I can just tell you that there's no one single you know solution to that probably because we will continue to wrote learn in school we will continue to um, read just before our exams uh, and not widen our portfolio of reading. Uh, we will continue to be hamstrung by the fact that um, uh, the the learning system um, encourages people to uh, be like some like the questioner said, be eloquent in English, use really big words. Uh, that you also don't understand the meaning many times and have to refer to the dictionary uh, and then uh, impress your teachers by those words and uh, write sentences that might have a beginning. Sorry for this noise. It's fine. But, uh, so uh, a story that might have a beginning, a sentence that might have a beginning, but you don't know where it's ending or what the middle portion was, etc. So basically, uh, that kind of uh, English writing is a, I would say, a, not even a colonial uh, uh, inheritance, but I would say something that we have grown up with and it's very difficult for us to grow out of when we come into higher education. So really, I mean, the one solution is to start early, start young, to see, look at our pros that matter. So. At least for this audience, I can say, go back and read something called The Elements of Style. It's a freely downloadable book, 100-year-old book, which also holds good today. It's got multiple imprints now. 
uh, it's called Elements of St Style by Strunk and White. It tells you what exactly is good, comprehensive, simple English writing. And uh, it tells you how a, a small sentence, as small as 10 words or five words or seven words is worth it. Uh, and you can break down every complex sentence that has got 25 words into two sentences. So, so very simple tricks like that can actually make your science writing or your, your just your English writing spring up, spring to life. And uh, all good writers use those tricks to make their writing uh, better. So, so how can we really switch from being uh, verbose uh, and eloquent to being simple and effective? That is the question. And I think uh, I think it takes a lot of uh, style tweaking, and it also takes a lot of practice and reading good prose. Uh, in science communication that will actually take you there. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, like as an editor, sorry. Okay. I'm sorry, as an editor, you would get like multiple uh, uh, publications or articles which are of various different fields. So how would you uh, be able to like judge how important a certain article is to a certain field? Uh, to a certain field? Which is outside your understanding, which is like not ah, okay. Your idea. Okay, so so as a science journalist, uh, I cannot afford to say I love neuroscience and I hate uh, cell biology or I can't understand astrophysics. I, I just can't afford to say that. Uh, again, as a science journalist or a, or a communicator, um, the, and, and many communicators actually restrict themselves to certain fields. Uh, which is fine, which is okay. Uh, um, so as a, as a popular communicator, I uh, and I and many others in, in the field try to understand the basics of each field and keep themselves current by reading about various emerging fields and then know not everything about those fields, but know where to get what. So... So that is the key to great understanding of subjects. So if I don't know, say, uh, the nitty gritties of nanomaterials, I will know people in the nanomaterials field who can guide me when I'm trying to write a piece. So I'll go to those experts and try to ask them, so I didn't understand this particular aspect of this paper. Can you throw some light? Or even the authors of those paper. And then bring them down to the level of the understanding of a 10th grader, or like we popularly say, to my grandma's level of understanding science, right? So I try to talk to them like that. I try to converse with them like I don't understand anything. And can they then bring that science to the level that I am seeking to? So if I don't understand the science, I won't be able to communicate it. And uh, that is the simple rule of thumb that you basically have to bring yourself down to the lowest common denominator of your audiences and then communicate it thus to them. So I hope that answered that question. Yeah, it did. Okay. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, you have uh, mentioned earlier that uh, you studied zoology and uh, later you plunged, I mean, uh, you took the plunge of studying journalism. So how did you decide that journalism was your field? And how was your experience as a chief editor till now? Okay, so uh, so I came to journalism uh, uh, by chance, not by design. Uh, I wanted to be a scientist. I wanted to do zoology. That I don't know whether I wanted to do research, but I surely wanted to study zoology further. Um, while I was uh, studying in uh, my undergrad level, I started writing as well. You know, um, I, all of us fancy ourselves as poets and writers at that stage, right? Uh, when we are in our, our class 11, 12, or uh, we're just graduating or are in our undergrad. So I also used to write and uh, I also had these, uh, you know, uh, images of myself as 
a great poet or a great prose writer. And I would take those uh, things to my teachers. Like I said, I, I had fantastic teachers. And I, um, I, had, I was very well read during my school years. Uh, I read a lot of prose beyond my curricula. Thanks to my parents and my extended family who introduced me to a bunch of, uh, you know, kind of reading. Uh, and it was very common practice to gift books uh, throughout my uh, school days to, to our friends. And uh, my, my family always ensured I had a bunch of books by my bedside to go to. So that reading actually helped me in my English and my parents were stickler for grammar. So any small grammatical mistake in anything that I wrote would be immediately very, very drastically pointed out to me. You know, uh, you know, it, it wasn't very, 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 you know, uh, cruelly pointed out to me <laughs> that this is something that you're not expected to uh, write or say again, you know. So, so that kind of environment was there. And then I wrote copiously uh, several things. Uh, you know, about life in general, about studying as an undergrad on subjects of zoology that we were studying. Uh, you know, I so I would write my notes in zoology and then I would write stuff like what I learned in this class and uh, why I hate this subject. <laughs> or why I why I love the subject and I would take those to those subject teachers and say uh, this is something that a young undergrad has written about your zoology's you know environmental science uh, subject you know so fisheries for instance uh, I hated how this taught us fisheries and I, so I told them that fisheries would be livelier if you took us to the pond and <laughs> told us what kind of you know or, or a lake and told us what kind of gear is used to uh, capture fisheries and what then happens to those fish how are they sort of used in the breeding programs etc and uh, and uh, when I wrote those things and I submitted it to my teachers they were very, very enthusiastic and, uh, you know, I should say that they, they took that irreverence very nicely and uh, that feedback very well. And they actually took us to lakes uh, in our subsequent classes and we had so much fun. And so everybody prodded me to write more and said, oh, your writing is effective. It's <laughs> it's turning out to be something that <laughs> that's making life better for us. So that's how it was in my college days. So, and I soon became the editor of my college magazine and then my university magazine when I was studying personal management. And then I went on to uh, start writing for uh, a new and uh, for a newspaper, local newspaper, while I was still studying. And um, the news uh, newspaper asked me to write a column on my uh, young days as a toddler. So it was called a toddler's travelogue uh, because my father was in the, was in the armed services, yeah. and we used to um, go from place to place uh, forever. You know, like. One class was there, class two would be in another school, class three would be in the mountains, class four would be in the beaches, some, mm -hmm. somewhere. So it was like that. So, and I changed schools. I so many, many so, um, wonderful growing up years that uh, I, I used to write and I sent the diary to the editor of a local newspaper saying uh, these are some of the stories from my childhood and they said these are fascinating stories but they will need severe editing because your style is like you mentioned somebody mentioned eloquent they have words that no reader wants to read <laughs> and uh, they have prose that is too complicated so let's bring that down to a level of a newspaper and start a column that that's called toddler's travel. So that's how my first column started. And I I thought since I'm doing this, why not I just uh, go into doing this professionally, you know, like, like going into doing a full-time course in journalism. So I appeared for the examination of the Indian Institute of Mass Communication. It's a All India examination and they choose about 30 uh, students every year for their English journalism course. Uh, and I got enrolled into that course, and that's how my journey began.
Uh, okay, ma'am. One of the distinct participants wanted to know: Is there any course for people interested in journalism communication, but within like B Tech levels, which we can do like alongside our degree? Um, yes, there are some evening courses now at the Indian Institute of Mass Communication. I don't know how long they are, but you could look at their website. Uh, Indian Institute of IIMC um, and there are several uh, journalism and science communication courses uh, uh, in many universities in India, central universities. There's one run by the National um, Some Council of Science Museums, uh, NCSM, uh, which is a master's degree, but they also have an uh, have kind of an executive degree which you can apply to. Um, I think for there are summer courses in many uh, places. Uh, Calcutta University has a great summer course, which is you can go during your summertime and attend that course. I used to teach that course for three or four, four years, but I don't know what's happened to it. Mm -hmm. You can look that up again. Uh, Calcutta University. There's one in Jadapur University that you can do. Um, yeah. Um, Lan, what do you think? Uh, yes, sorry, Arivo. What do you think is the future of India's scientific growth? Scientific growth. 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 Okay. I mean, I'll be optimistic. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we're making progress, um, and I don't want to sound too pessimistic, so I'll just say that we are not there yet in terms of uh, how globally we are faring. Uh, we, in terms of our publications at least, we uh, are, um, I don't know, um, the, the Department of Science and Technology um, likes to call it uh, number three in the world, but there are several other metrics that globally people use to uh, say how we are faring, and uh, we are not really uh, faring too well in that yet. But I, I see that there's a lot of interest uh, among people who uh, analyze these results of scientific output in terms of research output. and. Um, I know that uh, another metric to use uh, is also the impact of your work, scientific work. So how so socially impactful beyond the, you know, impact factor of journals, of your edge index, et cetera, all the metrics that are used to evaluate how good uh, a country we are as uh, science faring nations. Um, I think the social impact of science is something also to look at. And uh, there, I think we are doing uh, doing some great work. Like I said earlier, despite our jugaad, despite <laughs> uh, where we are in terms of resources and infrastructure, I think we we are faring well in those hands. OK, um, I'm so last two questions. <laughs> Okay, so what is your thought process while you're doing an important task? Switch off social media. <laughs> I think I think uh, while doing an important task, uh, these days at least, I really have to switch off social media because, um, you know, the, the kind of... Uh, my bread and butter actually comes from there, as you might yeah. understand, that as a communicator, you can't stay away from that. But I keep saying that many times um, the the algorithm starts to rule your life. So, so that's one aspect of what I'm thinking. But uh, I mean, that, that, I, that came to me first because that's mostly what I'm thinking these days. <laughs> when I do an important thing. But uh, the, the, the thought process uh, is ma, to try and see how I can maximize uh, the, the impact of my work. So in terms of what I'm writing or 
uh, who I am speaking to or uh, where I am talking like this, you know, uh, if I'm coming to deliver a, a talk or a lecture, uh, what benefit is it going to give to the people I'm serving? Uh, and I tend to think in those terms these days. And many times I, I of course, do it all pro bono. I mean, whatever uh, time I give to uh, doing apart from my uh, salary earning you know pursuits um, uh, whatever else i'm doing and there are many things that i'm doing currently is uh, uh, geared at thinking after all these years of doing science journalism what kind of impact have i made on the society so, uh, am i really moving the needle in in the dialogues that i wanted to have uh, and am i really making sense to people I want to serve. So that's my primary thought. That's what moves me. Uh, and also something that moves me is uh, how many lives I might be able to touch going forward. And if, even if I'm making a very small, insignificant change in the way people think or a way um, a student like you thinks, uh, I would think my job is well done. Okay, so ma'am, last question. So you mentioned like before how the COVID-19 um, information lack was the issue for which most miscommunication happened. Or, like, as you can see, most miscommunication happens because people tend to withhold information. So as a journalist, do you believe information should be free? Yes, um, I do think uh, information should be free. Yeah. <laughs> and why not that's why we uh, try to do journalism as opposed to many things that might come behind a paywall um, and i mean i respect uh, people's uh, safeguarding information yes. in in many ways and you know, things that are of national importance or significance might need to be behind closed doors there are things that um, you know high end uh, science many times has its own rationale for being behind, uh, you know, closed doors or behind a paywall, etc. But um, information most certainly should be free. Um, miscommunication more often stems from the fact that uh, a communication is done. Certainly in the scientific field, uh, science communication even if it is free many times, is not approachable or accessible. What do I mean by that? Uh, the kind of peer-reviewed science that we see in public domain, which is free to access, is told in a manner that not everybody can understand. So the jargon thing that we talked about, so. So not everybody beyond just your peers will understand that language. So even if you make it free, even if you even if the best scientist is going to tell their stories in their own scientific language, it is not going to make an impact on people. At the same time, somebody who's telling a piece of misinformation in a very lucid manner and in a nice video mm -hmm. that is uh, nicely uh, distributable on WhatsApp yeah. uh, will make so much more impact. So there you see, it's not just about making it free. It's also about making it accessible, understandable, legitimate. So, so data and information has to be freely shareable, accessible, and understandable. Unless all of that is done, misinformation will continue to rule. Yes, uh, that was the last question. And that concludes the ninth session of Newton Speaks and the last one of 2021. Oh, and it wow. seems like a perfect <laughs> one to uh, end this year. Curating content during this time of information is difficult. And you have told us how to curate the content uh, by equally uh, being relevant and interesting to the audience. Thank you, ma'am, for this amazing and informative session.
Uh, we hope everyone here enjoyed the session uh, because I personally and I'm sure Lakush also enjoyed yeah. it. Uh, we all enjoyed the session and uh, we hope, uh, thank you everyone for attending it. Uh, and we hope everyone will join for a future editions of Newton Speaks with another uh, engaging speaker. Thank you, ma'am, and everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.